It is our joy to welcome to our chapel today, Provost Karen Lee. And due to two generous benefactors, most of you have copies of her book. And she will be signing the book following the service. If you do not have a copy of the book, please see with me, see me following, and we will try to get a copy for you. Not only is she going to speak and sign books, she's agreed to have lunch with uh, students following the chapel. So as soon as uh, Dr. Lee is done signing books, we will have lunch with her if you are able. Dr. Karen Lee, welcome to the Graduate School Chapel. Thank you so much, Chaplain Greg. It's such an honor and a privilege to come and share a message of hope and encouragement with our graduate students and graduate faculty today. I, um, I chose Revelation 7-9 because um, I wanted to share a little bit about my families. Uh, one's a spiritual family, one's my biological family. And I like to call us the Revelation 7-9 family where we have different nations and tribes and tongues and languages um, in one spot in my heart. And so here's some photographs of, of my family members and I'll tell you some little stories about them. So through my matrilineal heritage, I'm a fourth generation Taiwanese Presbyterian and I was born and raised in greater Boston. My great-grandma was the first Presbyterian woman elder in Taiwan in the 1800s, and it was called Formosa at the time. And this was thanks to the evangelism of a Canadian medical missionary by the name of George Leslie McKay, and he has a Wikipedia page. <laughs> so he was a dentist, and in the 1800s, actually the 1880s, he went from Canada to Formosa, and set up you know, his dental um, mission field up there. So as told by my mother and my grandmother, as a young woman, my great grandma taught the Canadian missionaries how to speak the Taiwanese dialect after she accepted Jesus Christ as her personal Lord and Savior. And she also taught them a few outrageous anti-colonialist phrases. <laughs> Although my heritage is Asian American, well, okay, so this is just a little picture of, so there are antinomians and Armenians in my family, and I'll explain why. So Calvin is a friend to us, so is John Wesley, okay? So is the PCA, so is the Church of the Nazarene and the Assemblies of God, okay? So I, I think it set me up well to come to Wheaton here in an evangelical 21st century context. All right, so here's some pictures that if you visit my office, you can see these pictures to the left on my shelf. Okay, and then just a crazy picture here on the right, a lot of, lot of happy Asian people here on the right. So, okay, so um, although my own heritage is Asian American, I also have strong ties to African American Christian cultural experiences. So I love to share the story of how God blessed me not just with one, but two families on earth. After I was born and raised in New England and went to school in Rhode Island, I embarked on doctoral studies in the foreign nation of California, <laughs> and I settled in Northern California at UC Berkeley. There, God blessed my life with a family of African-American Pentecostals. Assemblies of God. And so as a young branch grafted into the holiness tradition, I then learned about the person of the Holy Spirit, whom I had not heard much about in my Presbyterian church growing up. So a grandmother um, in my spiritual family was attending the Assemblies of God church service that took place prior to my Asian American church service in a Seventh-day Adventist building. <laughs> and she would stay for both services. Um, she enjoyed the worship and preaching and the acoustical style of um, praise at my church, too. So we ended up attending membership class at my church together. 
and then she invited me over her house for Thanksgiving. So this is her great grandma, um, who we know as Mama, and they're from New Orleans. And over Thanksgiving in the house of God under one roof, after sharing a place of worship also under one roof and enjoying the wider net and embrace of Christian hospitality, an African-American Pentecostal grandma became a spiritual grandma and mentor to me during my doctoral years. And I became godmother to her grandson who lives in San Diego. So here's some um, bigger pictures. Okay, so my godson here in the middle sitting on this sort of daisy flower thing. This is in Oakland. Um, me in my 20s on the right. My hair was shorter then, less maintenance. And then left, okay, so left over here, um, there are also white Caucasians in my family. So my brother-in-law is French, Canadian, Hungarian, and my sister's Taiwanese Presbyterian. <laughs> And so these are their kids. They have five kids. So it's Elizabeth, Thomas. Let me see if I get all their names right. <laughs> it's a quiz for auntie. Elizabeth, Thomas. This is Peter, Paul, and then Joseph. OK, recognize those names. So uh, yeah, all right, let's go backwards here. Let's stick with the people. All right. So through Pentecostalism, I was introduced to the person of the Holy Spirit, and my grandma just has so many rich stories that have edified my own journey with Jesus, um, such as the story of an African-American pastor at one of her churches who only asked one question when he was interviewing staff um, to serve in his church, whether it was for facilities, for hospitality, or on his ministry team, for children's ministry. He would ask, how are you at winning souls? How many souls can you win into the kingdom of God? And then he would ask all the sort of logistical um, kinds of questions about professional experience and so forth. So she learned early on it was very important that the evangelical mission of the church would thoroughly infuse the church body with a unified kingdom vision and purpose of soul winning. So through these personal experiences and stories I heard on my faith journey, um, they, they helped us shape how I would come to envision an inclusive, Christ-centered campus at my two former institutions. One was Assemblies of God, one was Nazarene, and now a Christ-centered campus here at Wheaton, where we do have many nations, many tribes, many languages, many different kinds of people, harmonized and strengthened through unity and diversity, and also a powerful sense of biblical justice, a healing environment, and a learning environment where everyone can thrive. Biblical diversity, where we honor one another's dignity, fosters healthier environments for work and for learning and personal growth, and also learning together in community, and helps Christian organizations avoid the loss of creativity and the suppression of God's talents. A diversity of voices helps us avoid blind spots and strategic thinking due to exclusion or bias, and in particular, I recall taking an ethnic American literature lecture class with a Dr. Leslie Bow at my undergraduate alma mater in Rhode Island. And Dr. Bow was the first Asian American woman professor I had ever encountered on campus. And I tried to follow her everywhere. <laughs> I respected how she conducted herself with grace, yet with firmness and self-assurance, and knew her subject matter specialty inside and out. Under Dr. Bo's mentoring and influence, I received a vision of possibilities for my own future as a professor of literature and writing, one who could blend her fondness for books and teaching with a passion for the word. So a couple words on, on stuff that we're going through here at Wheaton College, and this is just a picture of me peeking out as I stand in front of the Revelation 7-9 um, display of crosses at Honey Rock. Uh, where I had an opportunity to visit many new friends this summer. So this season is one like none other in the history of Wheaton College. Our faculty, staff, and students have persistently demonstrated both courage and resiliency through their faith. 
When I arrived in the late summer, over a year ago in August, I found my new colleagues prayerfully immersed in preparations for the fall semester, actively engaged in delivering the Christ-centered quality programming central to Wheaton's academic mission. I saw everywhere on our campus the evidence of faithful lives dedicated to upholding a Christ-centered, safe community that is very brave, socially distanced prayer circles, Bible verses on murals, and also the word of God in the mouths and hearts of our people. Danielle Strickland, a major in the Salvation Army and author of the book, A Beautiful Mess, How God Recreates Our Lives, has written, my experience of life with God is messy. It's a mix of failure and success, courage and fear, faith and doubt. Since God invaded my life, my whole world has been a beautiful mess. I've been recreated by a designer who loves to recycle. My life has taken a new shape. It's characterized by light and by love. It's a celebration. Even if it looks a little out of control, it belongs to a loving God who has a beautiful plan. You are invited to journey into God's creative plan to make a beautiful mess out of your life. Like a master artist, he is ready to take the colors of your current life and craft them into a beauty that is beyond our earthly comprehension. So our journey with God in this pandemic and then amidst the political polarization can be really messy sometimes, like paint thrown on a canvas. It's true that our earthbound lives are often human messes that we make ourselves, but which offered up to Christ are utterly transformed in the presence of the Holy Spirit, whose comfort and wise counsel opens our hearts to Christ's beautifulness. So let's continue to offer our lives here at Wheaton to God and praise him for his love, mercy, and his faithfulness and confess our shortcomings within our nation and to each other systematically. Let us also ask Christ to help us be more like him, to be people who love God, who love their neighbors, and work to spread the fragrance of Christ. Jesus smells good. We must pray for our future leaders, whoever they will be, not only for this season, but a century from now, the invisible Wheaton College in the future, which is seen partly now, where Jesus will, ingre uh, will increase and greet our descendants and their friends who will come to study here. The faculty and staff of the history department recently gave me a face covering that says, one day this will all be history. <laughs> We have an opportunity now to participate in making history by carrying out our civic responsibilities as Christians and living our lives in a way that glorifies God, who is equipping you in this Christ-centered community to build up the church and benefit society. So now is a wonderful time for Christians like us to show up and make a positive difference. Whether you are a graduate student in mission, ministry, and leadership, TESOL, education, psychology, HDL, or biblical and theological studies, this is a powerful calling upon your life where God is equipping you right now. So this summer when the world started opening up again, I had the opportunity to travel outside Illinois for a few weeks to Honey Rock and to the Black Hill Science Station in South Dakota. And subsequently, and almost as soon as this door opened, it started to close again with a Delta variant flaring up. And we reintroduced indoor masking, even outdoor masking, and social distancing out of an abundance of caution. And I realized in the waxing and waning and phases of uncertainty and messiness throughout the pandemic, that we have an opportunity to learn valuable lessons such as humility, racial righteousness, to live without extra luxuries, to re-engage spiritual practices, confession, journaling, prayer walks, breath prayer, and to understand with greater depth that honoring God and loving our neighbors as ourselves are essential. 
If it were not for the greatest commandment of loving God and our neighbors as ourselves in Matthew 22, and the great commission of spreading the gospel to the ends of the world in Matthew 28, a Canadian dentist might not have gone to Formosa by ship to meet my great grandma, and my family might not be Christian. So because of Matthew 22 and Matthew 28, I am blessed not just with one biological family, but a spiritual family too. The season of the pandemic, political polarization, has, and violence has underscored the essentials in my journey with Jesus. Here's a poem I wrote as a meditation upon these essentials, which I shared at faculty business meeting, and I would like to share with you as well today. To the smaller world inside this one. For six weeks in the late summer, we tossed our face masks and laughed in the night, drove north to the place of strong trees, bolder than ever, more loving than before, washed in the delight of meeting face to face, sharing a table. And now yet again, we must love one another at a distance, closing the gap between our hearts. As the world starts to open to the rumbling routines of people, it starts to close its doors again. We are like bumblebees caught inside a squash blossom folding at night, its dressy petals pressed in a chamber of lesser air. We can still breathe through our spiracles in our abdomens, our blood organs bathe in hemolymph, alive even in this swaying world tucked into the other smaller world again. If the bumblebees could pray, they might murmur or hum the ancient blessing of a refined, perfumed anointing about the oil of gladness and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. Without the blissful levity of bumblebees whose wings bear a burden greater than one they otherwise might, a body of errancy is the only human tender, this fallenness. In this smaller world, we praise God for essential things, we wonder in the late solstice when the smaller world will open its vault of unbounded light. Even the bumblebees in a day or so will change to ash from the raging wildfires. And if not, their own mortality will drop to earth as we who are human must live, breathe, and move without knowing our appointed day. So I'll read two more poems, and since my new book is here with us today, I'll read two poems quickly from this book. And by way of background, um, the, this manuscript took a long time to publish, so poets have to be very patient. Um, there are only so many presses, and so many presses that are interested in arcane devotional contemporary poetry like mine. <laughs> And this came about because I was at um, a, a festival, a writing festival, an arts festival sponsored by Seattle Pacific University, was invited to teach a workshop. And what I'd like to do is when I assign writing exercises, there are about a dozen of them in this book, I like to write alongside the students. So I continued writing after the festival. That sequence of um, 12 exercises or so became a manuscript, I noticed that there were some parallels to Virgil's Georgics. So if you're interested in classics, you might check out the Georgian type of references here. And um, you know, there's a lot of you know, um, concern about stewardship of creation, about disaster, about um, you know, just being within our bodies in this very difficult um, earthbound world that we are in because of the fallenness, but also to engage the presence of the Holy Spirit as a source of hope who guarantees as a deposit um, the hope of eternity to come. And so there are glimpses of different kinds of fire in the poem. So there's a you know, I lived in California, wildfires are a very real thing, but then the fire and the flames, the Pentecostal flames, the presence of the Holy Spirit as well. Okay, this poem I wrote because I learned that a group of moths is called an eclipse, and I thought that was really neat. <laughs> On prayer, an eclipse of moths 
Jade vein Luna, without a tongue or proboscis, fated to die of starvation, emerges from her pupil and in star stages to the e adult imago with a day-old celadon wing. A group of moths is an eclipse. A moth spreads on a summer screen. Rear kitchen, where a steaming dish of saffron rice bore the heat of golden sulfite raisins, almonds, oxidizing flesh of dark aubergines in a roux of butter and flour. A group of butterflies is a kaleidoscope. I fail to set aside the silver for a mug of dove's dung in a season of war, five shekels, whether or not this was actual dove's dung or a wild vegetable. I live as a single woman in a time long prior to the naming of groups of birds as follows. A group of ravens is an unkindness. A group of swans is a bevy in flight. In turn, a bevy of flamingos is a flamboyance. Neo-Georgic, echoed by a girl who hears crepuscular, yet utters muscular, the marsupial and corpuscle, more kith and kin with fauna and flora in genera, or crepusculum, the dusk. Origami of paper plums and a washi of mulberry paper, six-cornered light. If we wish to complain of hunger, reflect on this. A luna moth at maturity has no mouth which is true, when they come out of their cocoons, the luna mouth, um, as adult moths, they don't have mouths because they don't have to eat. They only live for a couple days. It's a um, tragic, interesting, beautiful. A thousand florets of inborn zeal, north, north, in a compass, as if obliterating a code of fugitive moths, in a global warming, a red garland of light lassoing Bougainvillea says, oh, the light, four zeros of perfume. Praise lingers on a bright forehead, a gardener, evening, a borelate glare, even as his eyes dimmed, psalm of mission stucco, skyward carbonate mall, closer to kin to sea coral rag than an ichnofossil trace. Saying ethereal is too easy, not lowly enough. To say it bears the light is good. If I abandon my body to the flames, yet have not love, I am nothing. Gutted truth and bone drying samarmas, fissured green bearing thousands of flowers, no less haloed in skin than yours. Dew armed rose bushes who know nothing of Georgic catalogs of trees, breathing God at two in the morning. A thousand florets of inborn zeal shouting in the moonlight, slow maturing olive, pliant osier, bending broom, pear tree, transforming the engrafted apple yield, perfumed balsams, mountain yash, you. Thank you.